school is your environment right now. This is where we are. This is where our biotic and abiotic factors are. Our living and non-living things. All of these things are important for a really healthy environment. But we're gonna actually really start looking closer than you probably have before at our environment and how we can make it better. All right, so you're actually gonna evaluate. So I just made a note. So breaking down what your assignment's actually about, you've gotta make a conclusion about the health of our school's backyard. So you're actually going to do field work. That's what an ecologist would do or an environmental scientist. You actually go out and you have to say, there are this many plants, there's this many species of plants, there are these animals. And it's not just the nice animals we see that are really big, it's what's in the soil. What's the really important stuff? So you've got to evaluate that. You need to see what is there before you actually go, this is what I think we should put in. You need to be able to identify what's already there. Right, really important you do this part well. Because what you then do is you take that information and then you're going to make recommendations about how to improve our backyard to encourage more native birds. So that's very specific, but there's a lot that you need to learn about other insects because that's what birds eat. You need to learn about the plants because that's also what birds eat. So you need to learn actually what have we got how are we going to make it better to get to an end point of more native birds? In theory, if we got more native birds, would we get more organisms in general? Would we increase the diversity of animals and plants that are around us? All right, so I'm gonna hit some key topics, like I said today, that may help you out. You may disregard it, that's up to you. But please, and ask me any questions at the end, I'm more than happy to answer. So even though we're talking about the school, it's important for you to consider the greater area around us. So this is up at Springbrook, all right? So this is your, one of your closest national parks. You live in a country that is very good at preserving nature, all right? We are actually very good at protecting areas. So you have things like the natural bridge that's up at Springbrook. Who in here has gone and seen this before? Okay, a lot of you, it's quite a common weekend trip to go and do. There is value in this. Is there value in seeing plants and animals? Yes, but you actually get a, an aesthetic value. So what it's like to be in nature and what it feels like. It generally makes people feel good. So there is value in keeping it. What I thought I'd highlight bigger even in Queensland, why we're very lucky is this is right up north. This is the Daintree, okay? Now the Daintree and the Great Barrier Reef this is the only place on earth that two natural world heritage sites meet. So these are protected areas. And in Australia, in Queensland, in your own bigger backyard, you have two world heritage protected sites that join together. Nowhere else do we have that in the world, all right? So we are a very good country at protecting our ecosystems, okay? Now, this is the first key word. You don't have to write down the definition, you'll be able to look this up very easily. But the first thing you should talk about is biodiversity. So bio means biological. Now every time you hear biology, the first thing people think of is animals. But that means anything living. Animals, plants, insects, bacteria. All right? So biodiversity, it's the range of living things that you have in an area. Now the greater your biodiversity, the greater the health or the continued health of your ecosystem is. Now it's all relative. Rainforests have huge biodiversity. A desert does not necessarily have anywhere near the amount of animals and plants, but that's a desert biodiversity. And if you still want to have all those elements, because the idea is, if you have really good biodiversity, if we have some sort of insect that comes and eats a heap of the plants, you actually have enough there that it can cope in the long run. Having high levels of biodiversity means human impact in the long run can be sort of minimised. If we have something here that a car accidentally drives through and, and squashes some of these plants or something like that, if you have good biodiversity, over time it will recover if you leave it alone. If you have poor biodiversity, you'll probably end up getting species and things that grow really quick that you don't necessarily want there. 
right? So what you're really looking at with your project is how can we increase our plants to increase the diversity of birds that we have here, and specifically native birds. So when you look at the plants that are around us, there's some really obvious ones. So the one I picked straight away, because I know I look out this window, I see eucalyptus trees. And it's an interesting one because I've worked at this school now for almost, probably over a 20 year time period. And I would say now, and there's some people in this room that would probably know, we used to see an awful lot more koalas than we do now. I don't think I've seen a koala here in probably 10 years. Uh, we used to see koalas almost every lunchtime. There also didn't used to be as many buildings or as many homes at the back there. So things like that, we have an impact. So if you look at, you're going to go out there and identify plants and animals, there's plenty of apps to help you do that. And you want to hit those major species. But eucalyptus, very obvious out there, straight out that window. And things you can notice about native plants, um, the colour of the leaves are the colour they are for certain reasons, if you want to get that specific, all right? We have bushfires in Australia, and they're very devastating. But we have plants here that are designed, they won't germinate, their seeds won't open unless they're exposed to fire. So that's an adaptation of the Australian environment. So your animals and your plants adapt to what's here. Now, we've got species around here that used to also be around school, a lot more possums than there is now. So a lot more of these larger organisms. I show you this, we often get more of a reaction than when later on I show you insects. These are the things that people like to look at and talk about. Not necessarily what would be considered the most important for recycling things in an ecosystem though. So you've got the next sort of big word that you can write down if you would like to look into this. Koalas, these are called endemic species. E-N-D-E-M-I-C. So it's an endemic species. That means it's only found in Australia. So we have several species like that. Kangaroos, wallabies. They are only found here. And actually compared to other countries, there's only a couple of places which have similar levels of endemic species that we do. And that's places like Brazil where you've got the Amazon rainforest and Madagascar, which is a big island. This is the reason why when you go through airport security from overseas, they're really strict on you bringing in wood and different things from other countries because if you've got insects in them and they get out and they will destroy forests here we live on an island we're very separated you don't want those species getting in because they'll have long-term effects other countries where their borders join it's really easy for species it's not like there's a fence there and they're saying oh don't come across animals they just move whereas we are very isolated and that's true for our bird species as well um, I've got a statistic later. I think we've got maybe the second highest number of endemic birds in the world. So birds that are only found here because they can't just fly off to, you know, another country very easily. So koalas, endemic species. And that's something you can look at here. You've got secondhand knowledge from people saying that they used to be here, they're not now. What happened? Where are the trees that used to encourage them to be here? All right. Um, another key one that you might like to look at, obviously this is not roaming around school. These are found further north. This is called a cassowary. You don't need to write that down. Why I put this one in, and this is something you can consider, this is what's called a keystone species. So K-E-Y, like a key in the door, keystone. Keystone species. These are species that are really important to an ecosystem. If you actually removed cassowaries from the rainforests up north, you would actually lead to the downfall of a whole heap of different plant species. Because this bird, which is a really big bird, it eats very big fruit with very big seeds in it, and then it poos them out all over the rainforest. And they come out of the bird already fertilized, ready to grow. And they spread them all over the rainforest. But if you take that species out, there is no other animal that will do that. That's why it's called a keystone. A keystone is like when you have an arch, you can actually build an arch by putting in the, the rock at the top and it will hold the bridge up. That's called a um, keystone. You take out a species like this, it will actually really affect the ecosystem. So you might look at for yours, there might be birds here that would actually really benefit our area. 
They might germinate plants. It's not only insects that germinate flowers. So you might find a species that you would really like to encourage to be in the school. You've got to know what plants it likes. All right, so this is in your recommendation part. And like I said before, write this down somewhere. Do not forget the small stuff. Rainforests, which we do have rather close by. This is actually, most of your area around here will be temperate forests. Um, but rainforests actually have some of the poorest soils of any ecosystems. They don't have much soil. It's often quite rocky ground, but why they're really healthy and have lots of plants and animals is all that leaf litter that falls off the trees gets broken down. Okay, there's animals that are called detritivores. You'll learn about this with food chains. You probably did this in year seven, actually. They break down things because if you didn't have insects, you would end up with just dead stuff everywhere. So rainforests can have really poor soil because all the nutrients are still getting broken down by the animals eating stuff um, that's laying on the ground dead, leaf litter particularly. You'll find a lot of leaf litter down here. And that actually adds this really nice layer of food for all these insects. It also gives them shelter, all right, and protects them. You will be, I think, very surprised if you went and dug up one little cup of dirt down there, the amount of things that are in it when you look under a microscope is phenomenal. All right, so insects do not disregard how important they are. So things like cicadas, all right, these ones are interesting when you study them, how long they can stay underground and when they make all the noise and why aren't they there all year. So cicadas is a good one. Another one you want to consider though with your plants is we could potentially not only look at increasing the amount of birds, you could increase the amount of native bees. So pollinators. You're very lucky that you live in a country that has not undergone colony collapse disorder. So this is where in countries like the UK and America, they have had bee colonies collapse. Now you can be a farmer or you, you can be a beekeeper and you actually rent your bees out to people that have crops that need to be pollinated, that flowering plants. So you rent your bees and what these countries found is because of a, they think it's because of an insecticide, they all just started dying and not returning to their colony. A lot of scientists actually come and study in Australia because our bees haven't done that. We haven't faced the same issue. So really important for germinating and increasing species. And if you have a look around here, the flowering species that you see around our school are very many of them native. Does anyone know? Who would say that there's a lot of native flowering plants around our school? I can name probably three or four I see with any regularity that's a native plant. We often plant things because they look pretty or what we think is pretty and they might not even be from this country. Okay, we're talking about native plants. Other things that have happened through history in terms of biodiversity. These are considered a pest. All right, I see these, I live near Harbour Town. That's a pretty built up area. But any flat land that's there, I with regularity see rabbits. All right, now rabbits came into Australia, they were introduced, they are not from here. They were introduced with foxes for people to hunt as a sport, like an English sport. They didn't have the normal stuff to hunt, they brought in them, let them go, and they've now become sort of a real pest species because they don't have natural predators here. That was brought in for sport. Then we have issues that we have brought into Australia by choice. The worst thing in terms of pest control we ever brought into Australia was the cane toad. This was brought in, but this was brought in on purpose. We chose to bring this here because the idea was we have a lot of sugar cane in Queensland and they had cane beetles that were killing, eating the sugar cane. So people did study and went, oh, if we bring in cane toads, they'll eat the cane beetles for us. So in theory, it's all right, our sugar cane will be okay, the beetles will be gone. But what people hadn't really considered, they had no natural predators here. So you're essentially bringing in an animal going, smorgasbord, just food everywhere. And there was nothing to keep their numbers down nothing to keep their numbers down so they just went out of control a few animals here have learned to do things like flip them over and all sorts of things and that's learnt over a very long time but in general 
you can look into that actually as maybe a, a higher level thing. There's, there's stuff that we have brought in here on purpose to control what we see as biological issues. You've got to remember a lot of plants that we call weeds, weeds are just plants, and they are in some countries, they're like national flower. But it's considered a weed to us because we can't control it. And there's huge issues in our national parks just here where people have to actually go in by hand and pull out lantana and ground some bush because you can't go in a national park and just spray weed killer everywhere. Right? But you've got to remember, that's still just a plant. And a lot of plants, it's very popular, and I'm guilty of it. I have cactuses at home and different things. They're not native to here. Um, so we're looking at what could you do to make this more native and bring back the natural environment of the school. So we want to start avoiding things like this. So I would say too, in, in, in the amount of time that the koala numbers have gone down, I have never seen as many ibises at school. All right, and as they get called, bin chickens, because they eat your rubbish. As the school population, so when I first started here, there wasn't a middle school over there. That didn't exist, okay? Um, and there wasn't the new big buildings and stuff, obviously. So there's a lot less um, people on this campus less rubbish. These are opportunistic animals. So one of your criteria should be considering this because do you think this actually scares away smaller native species? It's a pretty decent sized bird to be roaming around. And they will keep roaming around as long as we have rubbish laying here and things they like to eat. They don't come and eat our plants. They come and eat your chips that you leave on the floor. All right. So things like that, that could be part of your evaluation. The other bird that we have, this dive bombs me as I go up to the library. So these are Indian minor birds. They are not native. If I'm being honest, I would say these are the two birds I see at school the most by far. Would you agree? Okay, you're not seeing many of these. Okay, cockatoos. How could we encourage them to come? You need to think about things like, what do they like to eat? What could we do to encourage them to be here? They're a native bird. What about lorikeets? These, some of these are quite simple. Do you know where around school you see these? If you go towards a sports centre. Why? Because there's these plants. Right? This is the sort of thing, could we not plant banksias down here and wattle? On the other hand, there's things to consider with stuff like this. Why don't people necessarily love wattle all around a school? Yeah, the pollen and people get like a sniffly nose and things, right? So that is something you consider, you can consider when you talk about plants. Is it great to have wattle to encourage native birds? Yes. Is it necessarily good for a school environment where people have allergies? Probably not. But there's so many species of, of plants locally that you could look at putting there that would very clearly encourage lorikeets and animals such as these. I mean, how nice would it be to see those sitting at the window instead of Indian minor birds that fly at the windows? Um, last one I put up, because I thought you might like to write this down as something you could use. Statistics have power, right? So there's some really good websites that you can look at. And this is what I was talking about before. You're specifically looking at birds. You live in a country, so the endemic I said before, so endemic, rem remember, means only found here. The only country, and this is quite, I'm quite happy with that, is statistics, 2019. And this is done by um, the Red List, which is nationally, well, internationally recognised, actually. This is what talks about species and, and classes them endangered and things like that things like that. You've got really good data here and you have a look. You live in a country that has the second highest number of endemic birds in the world. 